The women in our class hailed from many different backgrounds and experience levels, which made our class rich with stories of family, tradition, travel, villages, stress, sentimentality, reflection, motherhood, memories, strength, and healing. At some point in our journey through our writing and storytelling, it became obvious that this was much more than a class for many of us. It was a safe sanctuary where each woman felt supported and finally had an audience to share that precious memory about that person or place or thing that meant the world to her. What was even more compelling was that for each story the women shared, there seemed to be many more at the tip of her tongue that she was burning to share as well. It was as if no one had taken the time to see or hear our untold stories, not even us. For there were so many of our stories, dreams, feelings, frustration, fears, and desires that had never seen the light of day until now. Our class gave us the place to do that, and for that we will forever be grateful. We hope to keep talking, keep exploring, and keep creating. It is up to us to write the next chapter in our lives. Someday, someday I will be a mommy. Someday I will be a mommy. Someday I will have a little one to love. I will kiss on his feet and rub on his tummy. Someday I'm going to be the proudest mommy. Keep cuddling. Sweet, soft, Shaheem. Sweet, soft, Shaheem. Keep crying, cuddling, and caressing, for it will not last. These little feet, they are like a postcard or a promise from my children that their souls are around me and that they will be born through me someday these little feet. Maternal. At 33 years old, I thought I would have been a mother by now, but there was always something to get done first. School, house, job, and being settled. But I'm beginning to realize that motherhood is messy. There is no perfect time or place. Your children are a part of you, no matter what stage of life you're in. Watching my sister Crystal has taught me that. It hasn't always been easy to be the big sister without children, while my little sister led in that department. As much as I want to be jealous, it's hard not to be anything but proud. My little sister is a great mother, and she's taught me not to put any conditions on motherhood. Organized chaos. My kitchen is rather unkept, not dirty, but haphazard. As I do not have much storage space, I like my food. I have really too much crammed into the small area where I cook. Every now and then I try to clear off the counter, but inevitably I either discard something which I need a few days later, or I forget where I put something as I buy another one only to find the first one somewhere in the chaos which are my cupboards and countertop. Unfortunately, cooking for one in a way is difficult as most recipes are for a minimum of four people, which means that either you gorge yourself the first time you cook or you end up eating the same thing for several days in a row. Isolation. You can't see my house from the street. It's hidden behind three barriers, an old house, the garage, and the grapevines. I isolate myself because I'm comfortable in my skin. This is the TBI group that I am part of. I used to live here, but I now live alone and go back to the day program every day. My ultimate goal is to be independent, to have a job and my own car. Going to the group gets boring, but is something to do every day. It is my anchor right now. It is difficult having to be driven everywhere. I always have to find a way to get to places. Ifrika is one of my personal assistants. She is willing to take me out into the community almost every day. She makes me feel less isolated. I am very thankful.
I am talkative and love to socialize. I am disciplined and love to exercise. I probably should take up meditation. Instead, I rely on prescribed medication. Driving can make me really nervous. Sometimes I think people cut me off on purpose. I consume brown rice. It keeps me healthy. I don't smoke or drink, nor am I wealthy. Photography is one of my passions, you see. It's a form of expression and outlet for me. I am a perfectionist, and if you must know, I keep bottles and cans lined up in a row. A chocolate bar I can't resist daily. An addict I am, willpower does fail me. I spend the time when I see an opportunity to do volunteer work in the community. From my parents, I learned to be funny, and if I could, I'd do it for money. I didn't think I could write a poem, but then I said, come on, you can show them. I was raised in a family that treasures old photos and mementos. They connect me to the past. A little at a time, Mom has offered things to me. I remember sitting on her bed, winding up this music box, and listening to the tune while she sat at her sewing machine. I can't remember the song now. My mother's old brownie camera was at every family occasion. I'm so glad that she liked taking pictures. I have followed in her footsteps and I take great pleasure in doing so. The retired brownie sits on display atop my mahogany desk given to me by my mother. I look at it and it's like she and my father are right here. This is the only doll I have from when I was a little girl. She was a Christmas gift. When I became too old for dolls, she was put in the attic, only to be re-gifted in a new dress by my mother at another Christmas. Then the poor little doll was put into protective custody until a few years ago when my mom, keeping in tradition, crocheted yet another dress and gave her to me at Christmas again. I don't think it's a coincidence that the doll keeps coming in and out of my life. I think she's here to remind me that I can always go home again. At the end of the day, the doorknob welcomes me back home. It's been doing that for the past 18 years. I think it's beautiful. This is not just my home, it's my sanctuary. This is where I spend most of my time when I'm home, just like I did growing up. The only difference is that the chores are all mine now. I love that I have a window at the sink so I can look out and see if it's snowing, raining, or windy. Every Friday, I take my 85-year-old mom out to lunch. I've been doing this for a couple of years. When I pick her up, she's usually still putting her makeup on, and she'll ask me if she looks okay. I always tell her she looks lovely, and she always starts to sing The Way You Look Tonight by Frank Sinatra. We both look forward to our lunch dates. I cherish all the time we spend together. My name is Samantha. S is for spiritual. A is for artistic. M is for mother and grandmother. A is for amazing. N is for natural. T, talented. H, humble. And A is for aware of who I am. Elinda. E is for exotic. L for loving. The other L for listener. I for intelligent, N for nice, D for daring, and A is for attractive. Grimes, G for gifted, R respectful, I incredible, M for magnificent, E experienced, and S for strong survivor. Awakening. Morning glories are my favorite flowers. Look how they wrap around the iron post. I took this picture at 8.30 in the morning when they were awake. Tree of Life. This tree is very special to me. It is right in front of my house, and I see it every day. If I ever move, I will miss it terribly. The sight and sound of this tree makes me feel that Jehovah is near. Imagine, even though this picture was taken in the middle of the city, it looks like the rippling waves and sand of the ocean. I may not be able to go to the beach, but I imagine myself there. Bubbles, I love my grandson, Tequan, as much as he loves his bubbles. 
As soon as he wakes up in the morning, he wants to blow bubbles. He could do it all day long. As the bubbles rise into the sky, I can see rainbows reflect in their delicate skin. Like his childhood, they won't last forever. Catching shadows. What do you see? A rose? Concrete? An angel? Picture of me? Our way to start a conversation. We look at the same thing, but we see something completely different. It's my job to capture everything interesting so we can have a conversation together. Once upon a time, there was a girl. On a dark and stormy night, the wind picked up and howled. It rattled the windows. A gust blew open the front door, flew up the stairs, and blew out her soul's pilot light. In the dark, she groped around for light, but there was none. One day, she awoke to a flutter in the belly. A flopping fish churned her insides and squeezed her lungs. Nine months later, the fish flipped the switch and relit the pilot light on his way out. He flopped onto shore, and as the sun dried the water from his glistening skin, he was transformed into a golden-haired boy. Ordinary looking, but for his shining eyes. He grinned up at the girl, and she knew that he was no ordinary fish. They lay on the shore, soaking up sunshine, until the heat forced them into the water to cool off. The girl swam out, watching the smiling boy. She dove down deep, reveling in her newly ignited soul. When she came up for air, she watched in horror as a lumbering monster stole the boy's voice, put it in an old rusty coffee can, and ran off over the hills with it. The boy didn't seem to mind and happily went back to playing. The boy's mama was bereft at the loss of his voice. How would he survive without a voice? How would she find out what the boy had come to tell her? She left the boy on the river's shore and chased the monster. She grew more and more weary, running slower and slower. Her soul's light again began to dim so far from her boy. Exhausted, she tripped and fell, and the monster stole something from her. Too tired to chase the monster any longer, she walked slowly back to her boy on the shore and lay recuperating. The boy's eyes still glimmered, and his little chubby hands tugged at her to build sandcastles, but she lay there too tired to move, feeling she had failed him. It was her fault that her boy had no voice, because she had looked away. Her body sank deeper into the shore. Weeds began to grow up around her. She could hear the boy splashing along the edge of the river, but she was too tired to lift herself out of the muck. The boy could no longer reach her through the weeds, and with no voice he could not call to her to tell her to come and play with him, or that the sun was still beautiful on the water. Being the mischievous and stubborn little boy that he was, he began to toss things over the weeds to disturb his mother's sorrowful slumber. At first, he threw small pebbles, then wet mud scooped out from the shore, finally fetid, stinking swamp muck. She woke with glop on her face. Angry and filthy, she charged out of the grass, weeping and wailing about all that they had lost. The little boy looked down with curious, wide eyes that still glistened with mischief and delight. When she had sobbed all of her tears and had nothing left, the little boy walked over and put his chubby, grubby little hands gently on her face. The girl asked, But aren't you angry that I couldn't stop the monster? That I couldn't get your voice back? The boy just shook his head and wrapped his chubby little fingers around her hands and tugged her to standing. His face lit up with delight. He splashed her and stood back with a devilish grin on his face. She looked at him, and she began to forget what it was exactly that the monster had taken. As they played in the water, she kept expecting to see a shadow come over the boy's face, some sort of sadness or anger about what they had lost. But there was nothing. The boy just beamed, happy to have his playmate back. As the summer faded, the girl realized that everything the boy had come to tell her could be read in his eyes, in his chubby little fingers, in his mischievous grin. They sat on the shore, watching the sun dip lower in the sky. The heat dried the water off their skin, and an old rusty coffee can drifted up on shore. She left it where it lay and nestled her head against the boy. Ian was born missing part of his brain. After five years, countless specialists couldn't determine the cause or whether the disease would progress. This year, I discovered that I had late-stage neurological Lyme disease that caused lesions in my brain and that Ian had contracted Lyme disease during my pregnancy. We're both currently being treated. I will most likely recover completely. Much of Ian's brain damage may be permanent, but we swim a lot more these days. Ian still occasionally flings muck to keep me in line.
It takes a village to raise a child. This old African proverb is often quoted when expressing the need for all of us who are responsible people to love, to correct, and help bring up the children whose lives we touch. My personal village experiences have usually involved my church community, which encompasses my family, my church family, and my friends. My black church is my African village and is the social unit formed by our living together in this congenial and spiritual community called Macedonia. The term villagers refer to blood relatives, church families, and friends. The village fathers are the men within the spiritual community who've taken on a paternal role of caring for all the children within the village. To these village men who may not have had the benefit of a father themselves, I am even more impressed by all that you do. Your grief has not been turned into depression or rage against yourself or against others, but you have chosen to use your experience to motivate you to become stronger. We, the women and children of the village, salute your dignity and your strength. We celebrate you because of your continued efforts to keep our families safe and protected. You are the husbands, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, brothers and cousins working hard to keep our black families together. There are village children's characters to be molded and precious lives yet to be saved because of the work that you have begun. So don't get weary. You bring honor to other men who live their lives exactly like you, choosing to parent their children and other children too. So from this African village, we women and children thank you for staying and not leaving us on our own. Last Friday, I visited the cemetery that my parents are entombed in. We're supposed to be working on a project about ourselves, which I am entirely uncomfortable with. I signed up for the class thinking it would stimulate creativity and ambition in me to capture everyday life around me and to make it beautiful. I'm okay at photographing landscapes, but I wanted encouragement to capture everyday normal life things and turn them into art. It's been a difficult project for me because I didn't know they were going to make us focus on our own lives. I wanted to focus on others' lives around me. My final project is about my family, or lack thereof. I lost my parents in my early 20s. One when I was 23, the other followed a few years later, after remarrying a woman who took our entire estate and gave my sister and I nothing from it not even family photos or stuffed animals from our childhood. I miss my parents every day, my father especially. Above all, I miss being part of a family. Most people can't imagine what it's like to not have a home to go to for the holidays. There's no one calling to see how you are regularly. It can be very upsetting at times, especially around the holidays. I took a series of digital photos first to test the lighting in the mausoleum. Then I used the film camera to represent my lack of and search for family. I don't like the fact that my parents are in a mausoleum. I usually spend about three minutes there. This particular evening when I was leaving the mausoleum after my shoot, I saw the most extraordinary thing. There was a man in his 70s with cotton white hair who arrived and parked alongside the tomb in front of me. He made his way to the outside of the building next to this one with a relaxed sense of familiarity and habit. 
He walks slowly with a smile of anticipation and excitement on his face, as if he were going to visit a dear, dear friend. I paused for a moment to watch as he met up with a square and a name. He pressed his hands against the cold marble and drew himself flush to the wall, pressing his lips tenderly on the stone. He drew back slowly and moved his right hand to the name. I watched in awe as this gentle man traced out every letter and number on that stone with his forefinger and middle finger. He moved with the tenderness and grace that one would use while touching their long-since lover bathed in the glow of a soft candle after a passionate moment had been shared. I suddenly felt guilty for watching this very private scene. I turned away in great sorrow and grief for the man. I miss my family severely. I cannot imagine losing your chosen life mate. I wondered in that moment what it must be like to love someone with such intensity. It's very rare in this day and age, I am sure. I feel fortunate to have witnessed this beautiful significance. It's a vision that will forever be burned into my mind. Self-love. I've been living on my own in an apartment since I was 19, some 17 years ago now. I've learned a lot about myself living alone for that many years. I'm like an onion with many layers, each one concealed by the one above it. And as time wears away the outer layers, I get to discover the more hidden deeper parts of me. Through all of the ups and downs, I have been the only constant in my life the only one I can always count on to follow through when it matters and that won't let me down. I am my own best friend. Memories. Sometimes in the evenings after I eat dinner alone, I'll start to miss my grandparents and parents especially. With a large glass of wine poured, I'll slide out the silvery steel trunk that I keep under my bed and set down with a visit for my dear old loved ones. I was told a story about each and every one of these photos. I can hear them all still as I look at each photo, like a record is playing in the background. It makes me feel not so lonely. To do today. Contact disability for terminal cancer benefits. Fill out insurance forms. Arrange for hospice to begin visiting. Finalize my will. Write my goodbye letters to my sons. Start knitting a baby blanket for the granddaughters I will never meet. Last light. I took one last look as I headed out the door. I loved my job, even when I was going through chemo. The doctor has given me three months left to live. They threw a goodbye party for me today at work. Saturday Night Study Guides Saturday night spent alone again. Lord, what am I doing wrong? Strength Can't keep me down. My roots grow over and around. Rocks as hurdles, once blocking my way. Now, tall in a gentle breeze, I sway. Having conquered the earth beneath me, I am. I'm a sensible woman with a calm inner strength. I achieve what I need to get done. I am ever so grateful to the spirit beside me who helps fight every battle I've won. I'm a sensible woman with a calm inner strength. I was blessed with the son who I like. I am thrilled to have raised him from cradle to college. When I'm with him, I know who I am. My good sense comes from his grandmom he gets his good sense from me. Even if I'm judged most unfairly, I know that I've done my best and that I've used my good sense so I can rest easy when each day is done. 
I take comfort in how I was raised, in how I have raised my son. I'm a sensible woman with a calm inner strength, grateful to myself, my mom, and my son. Freedom. I was chained to a dictaphone for over 10 years, twisting and turning my mind to fit into a cage like a trained bird. Acknowledging my disability actually opened the cage door. There is so much more that I can do. My wings were broken, but I have grown new wings. A healing experience. I spent a decade facing discrimination in countless jobs. Finding supportive co-workers and a peaceful workplace finally nourished my soul. My favorite game. How many anti-inflammatory food elements can I fit into one dish? Blessing in disguise. My disability was a pothole on the road to a successful career. It was dark and deeper than I could have imagined. But it also gave me the pause and reflection to consider opportunities I may have missed. I am a strong black woman, kind, intelligent, and magnificent, spiritual and full of God's grace, always smiling, profiling, and moving at a steady pace. I am a strong black woman because I know who I am, full of love, willing to share it with whomever I can, never expecting anything back, always giving until there's nothing left. I am a strong black woman because of my faith and my hope, never giving up, always asking for strength to cope, always dreaming and believing that I can do anything, creating an action plan so my dreams will expand, standing tall but ready to give thanks to God if I fall. I am a strong black woman, educated, a good listener and very outspoken, a good speller, analytical and nobody's token a hard worker, persistent and realistic, a good mother, independent and very artistic. I am a strong black woman, that is who I am. Sleeping Beauty. Her head had barely hit the pillow before her eyes were closed. What a joyful moment for a tired mother of two young children to watch her child sleeping so innocently and peacefully. The barber shop. I feel at home at the barber shop. It reminds me of a family gathering. There is good conversation, much celebration, respect is expected. A soulful spirit moves through us, helps us help one another through everyday struggles. Like family, the barber shop keeps us rooted. Mother. Good listener hard worker, kind, strong, provider, always sacrificing for us, loves music and dancing, enjoys life, shy, quiet, spiritual, and caring. We have more in common than I ever knew. Good friends. Joab is very nurturing to his younger sister. When she is having a bad day, he will console her and even give up something he really cherishes if it will make her happy. Just me. I open my eyes both at the same time. It really happened. I took a potion last night to take away the pain. So far, so good. I put one foot on the floor. No pain. I put two feet on the floor. No dizziness. I stand up straight. I take a step. 
I am pain free. Usually it's a struggle just getting out of bed. When I was 25, I had to learn how to walk again. I love life. Potion or no potion, I make the most of every moment. I get my sense of humor from my dad. This is me. I wouldn't trade it for the world. The Irish Lad We are a reflection of our parents. Even so, he is becoming very distinctly himself. My great-nephew, Billy, knows what he wants. He trusts in his family. He doesn't like waiting for anything. I see myself in him. Baby girl. We call her Kay after my mom. She knows her own mind, even at four months. She loves classical music. Like me, she loves being outside. When I watch her, we are outside most of the day. She says hi already. Okay, it sounds like hi to me. This is my great niece, Caitlin. Mother, daughter, and father and son. This is my family. At the first family picnic, Joe stole my piece of cake. Little Joe did not fall far from the tree. Sharon is my sister-in-law. Her daughter, Lauren, gets her stubbornness from me. My camera. I am still waiting for that perfect picture. You know the one that is so right, the angle, the light, where it jumps out and says, take notice of me. It's not completely my fault for not getting the perfect picture. If only you would work with me. Don't tell me you're just a machine. You move when you're not supposed to. Why can't you flash your light when I tell you? Why is it so hard to get you to take the film right? That's your job. I put the film in, you grab it in advance. It's not that difficult. We have some interesting pictures. Not from what we did, only because the developer made a mistake and they came out backwards. Maybe I'm being too hard on you. We have some good pictures. Not great, but good. I want to capture that sparkle in that person's eye. I want to bring to life that old building. It has a story to tell. So many years, so much knowledge. I want that building to talk to me. Let's get going. We need to take what we both know and make it happen. Why are you still laying around? Come on, get going. That perfect picture is not going to take itself. Vulnerable. The depth of my true self lies behind the mask. My foundation will not wash away. I chose my own path. I do not have regrets. Each step taken led me to where I stand today. Temporary escape to another place. Erase chaos from my mind. Sun dancing through the trees. Lost in the warm breeze. Drifting through my body. Lead me to inner peace. Thank you for the opportunity to let me come inside your house, opening the door to a memory I will never forget. It was one of the best feelings I had when I walked into the house you lived in, and even more amazing to sleep in the room you were born in, to look out the window to the wonders growing in the yard. Even though the story was being told in another language, I understood every word of the beauty that was born in the place I stood. I now have an inner peace that will always lie within. Thank you, Mom. I love you.